sao in ring shring ka e la ring asang ka hala ring ta ka la ring sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. So, these videos in this space of time are called the big picture, part of a series that wrap up all the teachings that we've given over years, past years, leading up to this high-level view of the entire work. Why is that? Well, because we can't talk about the big picture until we're clear on the details. See? We can't talk about the high-level abstractions until we understand the underlying mechanism. See? We can't meaningfully talk about taking a journey until we're familiar with the map. So all the background that we've been building up for like seven years, eight years now, is just to support these final high-level insights. I have avoided talking about death because after all, it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Isn't it why we go into spiritual life? Isn't it why we strive for enlightenment? Isn't it why we endeavor to understand what's behind life and consciousness and knowledge and so many things? Because we have to deal with this great unknown. But it doesn't have to be an unknown. If we understand life, we can easily understand death. Life is called in the Vedas, Panchakoshas, five sheaths covering the being, covering the consciousness. These are upadis. You see? You see why I have to talk about upadis before I can talk about this? <laughs> Five upadis, limiting adjuncts that make what we call an individual. So what are these five sheaths? Well, the first one is this material body, the gross body. The anamaya kosha. Ana means food, food grains. So this body is built from food grains and other food. And moya means a construction, a fabrication. And kosha means a sheath. So the anamoya kosha is the gross body, the gross senses, and so on. Then we have the pranamaya kosha. Prana means life energy. So besides this gross body made of matter, we have a more subtle body made of energy. Then there's the manomaya kosha, the mind body composed of thoughts, thoughts and thoughts and thoughts, <laughs> thoughts about thoughts, and so on. Then there's the Vijnana Maya Kosha, the intelligence body or the will body that manifests the Icha Shakti, the potency of desire and will. And finally, the Ananda Maya Kosha, bliss, consciousness, beauty, all these come from the Anandamaya Kosha. So what happens at what we call death is simply that the Anamaya Kosha wears out, which like any material thing, it's going to do. So when it wears out, it drops off and we have to get a new one. Or it's possible that we can go to a higher realm 
where there are no gross bodies, there are no anamaya koshas, and only the subtle bodies are needed there. So this is the idea behind religion. This is the idea behind salvation. This is the idea of release from samsara, repeated birth and death. So how do we know that this theory is correct? Huh? In scientific method, you make a postulate. I think that such and such is true. And then you design an experiment to prove or disprove the postulate. And the whole point of scientific theory, which a lot of scientists these days seem to have forgotten, <laughs> That's another story we'll get into it another time. Is that your theory must be disprovable. Falsifiable is the technical term. So there has to be a preponderance of evidence either to prove or disprove your theory. Isn't it? Or to at least give more or less uh, credence or believability to it. So what is the experiment that proves or disproves this theory that we can gain moksha, liberation, and get free from birth and death? Well, it's called meditation. And what is meditation? It's a rehearsal for death. It's a simulation of death. It's a death simulator. Huh? Just like if you've ever studied how to fly a plane, you can get in a simulator and it has controls just like a real plane, but instead it has a screen and then the, the virtual world displays on the screen. So you can fly and it does everything a, a real plane does. It even uses calculations of lift and airflow and so on to uh, simulate the plane. So in meditation, we simulate death. How do we do that? Well, <laughs> the eight stages of the Ashtanga Yoga system give us a clue. First, there's Yama and Niyama. What to do, what not to do, to prepare for this simulation, to put ourselves in the right frame of mind for it. Huh? And then there's asana. Asana simply means sitting. So we have to be able to sit comfortably for a long enough period of time to run the simulation. Then there's pranayama, control of the prana, the life energy. And this is done through various breathing exercises. Of course, people have speculated and made pranayama into a whole weird thing that it's, it's originally not meant to be. The whole idea of pranayama was to reach the point where the breathing is minimized. And in the, in the Buddha's teaching, anapanasati, the meditation on the breath, is for the same purpose, to calm the breath to the point where concentration is possible. So then what? Pratyahara. Pratyahara means withdrawal of the attention from the senses. Then once the sitting posture is nice, once the breathing is calm, then you can withdraw the attention from the senses. And once the attention is withdrawn, what then? Dharana, concentration. We concentrate on an object. The object can be a mantra, or it can be the visualized form of a deity, or it can be a philosophical point, or there's innumerable topics for meditation. And then dhyana. Dhyana is the meditation itself. The meditation is something like watering a plant. <laughs> we can't force the plant to grow. The plant has to grow at its own rate. We can simply water the plant 
regularly, make sure it gets enough sunshine, fertilizer, whatever. And in its own time, it will grow and blossom and bear fruit. So we have to do a lot of dhyana, a lot of meditation, a lot of watering the plant of whatever it is we're meditating on to get to the final stage that is samadhi. Samadhi means where the mind becomes effortlessly concentrated on a single object. See? So at that stage, we're living in the mind or we're living in the energy body or we're living in the vijnana maya kosha, the will body, huh? or the ananda maya kosha. It's a gradual release of the lower bodies and a movement towards the higher, more subtle bodies. And this is what happens at death. It's exactly the same process, only we're doing it deliberately rather than having it forced on us by nature. See, what is death really? Death signifies that the prarabdha karma of the present gross body is finished. That's all. The causes that made this body, this gross body, come into existence have run out of steam. <laughs> uh, their influence is done. So the body disappears. It's quite a natural thing. Everything that we make, everything that we create, has a natural lifespan. And when it reaches the end, it's finished. The, the classic example is an earthen pot. An earthen pot is nothing but earth. But then when it's made into a certain shape, it can hold things, water, food, whatever. But then at some point, the pot becomes worn out and it breaks. This is a natural thing. And when it breaks, what do we do? We throw the pot on a pile <laughs> with other pots and let it go back into the earth. So the pot comes from the earth. It's nothing but earth in a certain shape. And then when it's finished, it goes back to the earth. Huh? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. In fact, one of the great meditations in the Shiva tradition is that everything is ashes. Everything that we see, everything that we know, everything that we are, everything that we have, its ultimate destination is simply ashes. At the end of the universe, when Shiva does his Tandava, Nritya, then everything is destroyed by fire. And all that's left is ashes, dust. Huh? It's all finished then that matter is absorbed back into the Mahatattva and the creation is done. So even this universe has to die. What to speak of ourselves? Oh, and I should mention in the Buddha's teaching, the eight jhanas. The eight jhanas are nothing but a similar progression of more and more subtle meditations that can sim simulate the process of death. Because we need to know what is going to happen. We need to prepare. We need to rehearse. We need to practice, just like a musician practices before a performance. The ultimate performance is the moment of death. Because as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, yang yang vapi smaran bhavam tyajatante klevaram that whatever state of being we remember at the time of death is where we go in the next life. So if we want to go to a nicer place, huh, which I think we all do, <laughs> this material world is full of suffering. That's just the way it is. So if we want to go to a nicer place, we have to qualify ourselves. What is that qualification? We have to be able to remember this state of being that we want to attain 
at the time of death. Now, what happens at the time of death? <laughs> the whole contents or the memory of this life passes before one's mental eye. This is a well-known thing. Huh? And what is the contents of this life? Well, it's what we do every day, isn't it? So if every day we meditate, if every day we pray, if every day we chant our mantra, if every day we make offerings and service, if every day we try to help other people understand these high spiritual truths, then what we're going to remember at the end of life is that state of being, whatever state of being it is that we have meditated on, served, taught, and made the center of our lives. So I really feel badly for people, atheistic people, who don't have any faith, who don't have any belief, uh, who don't think there's any afterworld or any God or any higher level. They're just gonna come back as a dog, <laughs> you know? Or if they're lucky, as a cat. <laughs> But why? Because they're meditating on this very low state of being, this low vibration. I am the body. No, the Vedas teach us, I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. Isn't it? So if we're always thinking and contemplating on Brahman, or if we can't conceive or concentrate on Brahman, we can concentrate on Shiva and Shakti. We can worship them. We can make offerings to them. We can serve them in different ways. We can teach the truths that they give in their scriptures and so on. And then at the end, we remember that. And therefore we go to that. I mean, you know, put yourself in God's position, right? Look at it from God's point of view. Uh, do you want, what kind of people do you want coming into your world? What kind of people do you want in your, your heaven, your abode, your transcendental paradise? Huh? You want just any old rascal? <laughs> I don't think so. I think you want people like, who see things like you do. So it's very important that we study the scriptures, understand the point of view, and even if we can't realize them here and now, uh, which is very difficult for a lot of people, then we have to at least understand and try to see things from that point of view, to become the kind of person that can live in a subtle world, in a subtle body, because these are where the heavenly places are. This is where the paradise is. This is where everyone is loving, everyone is beautiful, everyone is kind. You see? These higher levels, higher states of being, where there is no gross body to bother us with its daily needs to be fed and whatever, you know? These senses that clamor for our attention. Huh? That is all subtle, subtle, virtualized, and purified at the time of death when we leave the body in spiritual consciousness. And so that is why we practice sadhana. That is why we practice meditation. To attain that state of being, of living in paradise, to be ready for the time of death. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.